these were sideways, so it's hard for me to recognize them. Do you know which one we didn't do? Did we do two of them completely? We did uh, one page, so we're 17, on 17. You stopped on 17. Yeah, we're on 18 now. Okay. Uh, do you remember which of these that that is? Is it top left, top right, or bottom? Top right, probably. Top left, right here. Top That's left right. or top right? Top, top right. Okay. All right. Let me download that, and then if I click on it, I can then rotate it. All right. All right. Let's see. And then I can blow it up. At least I should have been able to. Oh. Okay. So... look at that parallelogram. Is that where you want to start? Yep. Okay. Find the area of the parallelogram. What's the general equation for the area of a parallelogram? Wouldn't that be uh, base times height, right? Yeah. It's the same as the equation for a rectangle. The only difference is, is that the height is the vertical height, not the slant height. What they gave us was the slant height. That 17 is a slant height. So we need to figure out what the vertical height is. Well, that triangle that's sticking off the end of that parallelogram, yep. that's going to be the vertical height. What is that? You can use a Pythagorean theorem. Okay, go ahead. So H is the square root of 17 squared minus 8 squared. I think it's 15, isn't it? No, yeah. So H is 15. So the area is the base. What's the base? Wouldn't that be 21? Uh-huh. So it's 21 times 15. All right. Let's look at 19. That's a normal-looking triangle where they give us the vertical height of 12, but they give us this angle. So they don't give us the full base, but they tell us that's a right triangle. So notice from the information they've given us, I can come up with that distance, and I can come up with that distance. In other words, if I want to label this A, B, C, D, I need A, D, and D, C, because that's the base of the triangle. What's A, D? I'm not sure. Well, use the Pythagorean theorem again. In other words, we're solving for the short side of a right triangle. Well, any short side of a right triangle is going to be the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the other short side squared. So that's what AD is going to be. And looks like that could be a 3, 4, 5 triangle, but it's not. They, they do that on purpose to kind of fool you into making this side 9, <laughs> but it's not 9. Whatever number you get when you plug that in um, is AD. Now, let's figure out DC. What trig equation can I use to get DC? You could um, 
is Scrooge, let's call that X. Okay. And now we're solving this triangle right here. So you want a trig function that relates X to 12. And be tangent? Yeah. So what's the trig function? It's 10, 29, would it be 12 over X? Correct. Now you'd have an equation with only one variable. So X is going to be 12 divided by 10 of 29. So now I have my two measurements. I know AD is the square root of this number. X is 12 divided by 10 of 29. And the area of the triangle is 1 half the base times the height. Well, I now know the base, which is AD plus DC. And the height is 12. I always knew the height. I never had to solve for it. So the trick was solving for the base. Okay, any questions about that? Do you have to submit these as to as part of homework? Yeah, we have to turn them in, but I don't think she checks. You have a calculator in front of you? Yeah, I've been um, doing it as the... Uh, Let's look so at numbers on these, since you're going to need them at some point. In other words, normally if we were just reviewing for the final, if that was our only purpose, then I'd be perfectly happy with dropping the problem once we get to that step. Or... <laughs> I don't care about the numbers myself, but if you have to turn this in, you you are going to care about the numbers, so we, we, we might as well figure them out as we go. So, right. first of all, what's AD? What's the square root of 16 squared minus 12 squared? 10.5. So that's 10.5. And what is 12 divided by 10 of 29? 21.64. So now we have everything we need. We have the base, which is the sum of those two numbers. So the area equals 1 half the base which is 32.14, adding 10.5 to 21.64, and the height is 12. So, and now, like I said, even if I'm doing a calculator, I'm going to combine the 1 half and the 12 and make that a 6. So now it's just 6 times 32.14, whatever that number is. That's the area of that triangle. All right, let's look at 20. 20 is a trapezoid. Blow it up a little bit here. What's the general formula for the area of a trapezoid? Isn't a something diagonal 1 plus diagonal 2? You no, know, it's... I tell you what the basic... I think the easiest way to memorize it is it's the base times the height. Okay? The problem is there's two bases. I got a 28-inch base and I got a 58-inch base. So which base is it? It's the average base. Well, how do you get the average base? You do base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2. There's the average base. And it's all of that times the height. So that's the area of a trapezoid. Well, they've given us everything. They've given us the top base is 58. They've given us the bottom base is 28. And they've given us the vertical height, which is 30. So the average base looks to be 43. So it's 43 times 28 is the answer. And that's assuming that their 58 there refers to the top base, which I'm assuming it does. In other words, that 58 right there, 
let's hope it's not the measurement from there to there. And I don't think it is. I think it's this, this thing certainly is not drawn to scale because the way they've drawn it, this thing is nowhere near twice the bottom, and it should be if it's 58 and that's 28. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need it drawn to scale. Is all you need is the general formula. If you have the general formula, that's usually all you need on these. Okay. 21, what that, what's that called? Okay. Okay, what's the area? Uh, this is area, right? Yeah, area of a kite is one. Hey, David, aren't these areas all square, um, whatever the measurements are, like square meters or? Yeah, they're, they're yeah. yeah okay. no, that's true. Yep, yep, yep. In other words, that's square inches on the left. Uh, on number 20, it's square. Now, they don't even put units on this one. So you wouldn't have any units on that, but it would be square units. They didn't put units on this, but it would be square. And this is the first one they've actually put the units on it, which are inches. So yeah, this would come out to be square inches. And this is going to be square meters. But most importantly, what's the formula for the area of a kite? And it has to do with these diagonals. That's one diagonal and that's another diagonal. Wouldn't it be um, diagonal one plus diagonal two? It's actually diagonal one times diagonal two. And it's one half of that. And let me show you how to memorize that. Why it's one half and why it's not just diagonal one times diagonal two. There's my kite, okay? okay. There's diagonal one, there's diagonal two. Well, if I want, I can draw a rectangle around that kite perfect rectangle. What would the area of the rectangle be? Diagonal 1 times diagonal 2, right? In other words, this is diagonal 1, this is diagonal 2, that's base times height. Well, clearly the area of my kite is not the same as the area of the rectangle. So we know that it can't be just diagonal 1 times diagonal 2, but it certainly looks like half. In other words, that is half of that little rectangle. Each of these little triangles is half of the rectangle that I've drawn around it. So 1 half times the diagonal 1 times diagonal 2 makes a lot of sense when I draw a rectangle around it. And that just makes it easier to remember. Um, most of these formulas, an awful lot of geometry formulas have one half in them. Okay, they're one half something or they're just something. So normally if you can just figure out whether it's half or not, you've got the problem licked. In other words, if your only difficulty here was not remembering whether it was D1 times D2 or whether it was one half D1 times D2, well, this will answer your problem because that clearly shows you that it's not D1 times D2. That would give you the area of the rectangle that I've drawn around the kite. And in this problem, they've given us everything we need. Diagonal 1 is 19. Diagonal 2 is 4. Again, I do that. So the area is 38 square meters, or meters squared. Okay? Okay. 22. Now, the only difference between 22 and 20 
you solve both problems exactly the same, which is to say you start off with the general equation. On number 20, the general equation for area was base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2, that's the average base, times the height. And they gave us base 1, base 2, and the height. So we were able to get the area straight away. Well, in problem 22, it's the same problem. It's just they give us the area and they want us to solve for one of the bases. So you're still going to start out with this general equation, the exact general equation for the area of a trapezoid. Okay, and now I'm going to substitute everything I know. Well, they've told me the area is 55, so I'm going to put 55 over there. Base 1 is the bottom base, 13. Well, base 2 is what I'm trying to solve for, x. Got to divide that by 2 and multiply it by the height, which they've given us, which is 5. So now I've got that equation that only has one variable in it, x, and I can solve for it. So let's solve this, as long as we have to come up with numbers. What's the first step in solving that? Wouldn't you um, distribute? Mm, that makes the problem a little harder if I distribute the 5. How about we get rid of the denominator? The way I solve all my equations, Patrick, is, boy, first of all, I try to get rid of denominators, then I get rid of parentheses. Okay. Well, I can get rid of this 2 by multiplying both sides by 2. And now I've still got the parentheses. And now I could distribute the 5 if I wanted, but that's not the easiest way either. The easiest way is to divide both sides by 5. That'll get rid of the 5. So divide that by 5 by 5 and that side by 5, those cancel, so I'm left with 13 plus x equals 22. Now it's a piece of cake. x is equal to 9. So all of these geometry problems they can make them one degree of difficult higher, like uh, this problem is one degree of difficulty harder than problem 20, merely because the variable is inside the equation, not... Problem 20, we were solving for A, so we just had to fill in each of these. Well, in this one, we're not solving for A, we're solving for B sub 2. But you start it the same way. And in other words, the secret of geometry is getting an equation that has one variable. That's the secret. And the way you do that is you always start with the general equation and you fill in everything you know and hopefully you only have one variable left. And so far, that's what we've been looking at on all of these is one variable only. Twenty-three. The length of one diagonal in a rhombus. First of all, what's the definition of a rhombus? There's one thing that kind of defines a rhombus. When I somebody tells me rhombus, I only think one thing. Only. I don't think parallelogram. Okay? Even though rhombus turns out is a parallelogram. Uh, hold on. What do you think when you think rhombus? Uh, hold on. Let me just put my dog there. Tell me when you're back.
All right, sorry about that. That's all right. Okay, when I think rhombus, the very first thing that comes to my mind is four equal sides. That's what a rhombus is. So a square is a rhombus. Okay? But it turns out that all rhombuses are also parallelograms. A square is also a parallelogram. Okay? The one thing I know for sure is that that side's equal to that side. Equals that side equals that side. Okay? Now, they've told us something about the diagonals. You'll notice that in most parallelograms, the diagonals are not equal. That's the short diagonal, the second one I drew. The first one is the long diagonal. Well, they've told us that the long diagonal is three times the short one. So if I call the short diagonal x, the long diagonal is 3x. A little hard to write, but so there's the short diagonal is x, the long diagonal is 3x. Now, the area of a parallelogram is the base times the height, right? Well, that's base, but that's also base. So what I need is this vertical height right there. All right. The other thing about a rhombus is that the diagonals always intersect at a right angle and bisect one another. So let's see. What? Let me think about this for a second. Both of those are isosceles triangles. How are we going to come up with the vertical height? In other words, y is what we're trying to solve for. If I can solve for y, then I can say the area equals base times y, right? So, and they're giving us the area. So I need to come up with y as a function of the base. Mm. Well, let's see. If I look, ah, here we go. Let's take each of these triangles. I'm going to call that triangle one, okay? Let's draw it separately outside the diag or the rhombus. One thing I know about this triangle is this a right angle. Okay. This is B. Well, this side is one and a half x, correct? And this side is one half x. reason this eludes me. Hold on a moment. Let me think about it a second. Even if I could solve for B in terms of X, I think that's going to get me the answer. Hold on a second. Yeah, 
because I need to solve for y in terms of x also. Um, let's see. This is b. And Hmm. Um, I feel like I'm making this overly difficult. It can't be as hard as I'm making it. Uh, and, and sometimes that's what happens with geometry problems is you take a certain view on it and you go down that path and you don't get to the solution it's probably because you took the wrong view on it. Or I'm taking the wrong view on it. Let's see. How do I solve for y? Um, if, let me think for a second. Yeah, the area of a parallelogram is the base times the vertical height, not the slant height. So we need to figure out why. In other words, I know that all four bases are equal. And I know that triangle one is congruent to triangle 2 and triangle 3 is congruent to triangle 4. I want to say, and I'm pretty sure I'm right here, but I want to say that's 1 half x. And now, if I look at this triangle right here, I've got one half x squared plus y squared equals b squared. And in this triangle down here, I can define b as a function of x. Clearly b squared is that squared plus that squared. Okay, so That'll give me um, b squared. If I replace b squared with this squared plus that squared, I get 1.5x squared plus... Hey David? Yeah. He's not going to remember this. Maybe we should skip yeah, this one because he's got some questions on the ones after. Okay. Yeah. I was going to suggest that. This yeah. is too deep for him, really. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's maybe too deep for me. I'm, I'm missing something of it that I, I should be seeing. And I'm having a hard time yeah. figuring out. Maybe we could come back with a fresh set of eyes if we got any time left at the end. Maybe All right. See it. Okay. But this this solution, God damn it, Rocky will know it. Yeah, no, I'm glad you interrupted and stopped me because I was about to say the same thing. But let's go on to the next one here. Uh, let's see, we've done 22. That was 21, 23, so we want to go to 24? Yes. There's something wrong with that problem or the way I was doing it because it was super difficult, whereas 24 is super easy. <laughs> What's the general formula for area of a circle? Minor squared. So what's the area of a circle that has a radius of 12 inches? It would be a pi times 12 squared. So it would be pi times 144 pi square inches. Well, what else is 12 inches? One foot, right? So if I used one foot instead of 12 inches, it would be pi times one squared. 
So the area is also pi square feet. One pi square feet is equal to 144 pi square inches. And that makes sense. If I have a square that's 12 inches on a side, the area of that square is 144 square inches. But the area of that square, if I convert this 12 inches to one foot, the area of that square is one square foot, right? So one square foot is equal to 144 square inches. And that's the only reason I can figure out why they put the problem here. Because otherwise, that's an awfully basic problem. You have your general formula and you just plug in for R. But they made it 12 inches for a reason, I think. It's the area of the shaded region called an annulus. It's the general area. What's a, a shaded region problem is always a subtraction problem, right? Yeah. So the area of the shaded region equals what? What area minus what area? Isn't it the... Um, the big the circle? Yeah, big circle. The area of the small circle. That's where you want to start all of these kind of problems is start it in the most general way you can. Well, if they're asking for the area of the shaded region, the area of the big circle is pi times capital R squared. The area of the little circle is pi times the smaller radius squared. And now, what's the big radius? And the big radius is eight. Eight. So, eight squared minus the little radius, which is 4. So we have 64 pi minus 16 pi, or 48 pi. It's the area of the annulus. We got it. 26. The area of one slice of a pizza, if the pizza has a radius of 10 inches and the pizza is cut perfectly into eight equal slices. Okay. Draw that. What was the radius? Uh, 10 inches. So if I draw a circle representing my pizza, got a radius of 10 inches, and I'm going to divide it up into eighths, right? Yep. What's the area of the whole pizza? That would be uh, 100 pi. What's the area of one-eighth of the pizza? Eight pi. Divided by 8. Not divided by 8 pi, but divided by 8. Because I've got 8 slices that make up this full area of the pizza. So each of these areas has to be 1 eighth the area of the circle. Well, the area of the circle was 100 pi. So it's just 100 pi divided by 8. Yeah, you probably want to leave that in terms of pi. I wouldn't convert that to a decimal. In other words, 100 pi over 8 is 25 over 2 pi. And that's the way I would present my answer, or 12 and a half pi, one or the other. But typically, they don't want you to convert pi to a number unless they explicitly tell you. In other words, if the problem says use 3.14 for pi, then go ahead and do it. 
but if they don't ever give you those instructions, always leave your answer in terms of pi. This is the most exact answer you can come up with. The moment you use a number for pi, you're approximating the answer. Does he have to put square inches on that? Um, yeah. In other words, if they give you units, then yes. I, I, I tend to forget them because half these problems, you'll notice, have units, half don't. Yeah. In other words, these first two, uh, that one didn't have units, nor did that. And then some of them, they have units. So wherever they have units, yeah, you have to, it's square units. In other words, problem 24 was 144 pi square inches. And the units were important because if we change that to one foot, then the area is just pi square feet. 144 pi square inches is the same answer as pi square foot. One pi square foot. So if I forget to put the units on it, it's because of that. It's because some of them have it, some of them don't. and uh, just depends on the teacher how important the units are. And in that annulus, it was square, whatever those are, inches, I guess. All right, let's look at 27. Find the area of a regular hexagon. Well, The area of any polygon, what's the general formula? Just, uh, oh, a regular polygon is one half apothem times side length times number of sides. Okay. okay. Now, they haven't given us the apothem. They've given us a side length. And we know the number of sides is 6, but we need to figure out an apothem. Well, the way you do it is you draw a triangle from the center of the hexagon to there. And I know this is 4. And if I can figure out that angle, I can solve for the imaginary apothem, which is going to bisect that triangle and bisect that angle. Well, what is the measurement of that central angle in a hexagon? Would it be 60? Yeah, it's 360 divided by the number of sides, 6. So this angle is 60. But that's not the angle I want. I want that measurement, the apothem. Well, if that angle was 60, after I draw the vertical, what's the smaller angle? 30. Now, let's draw that triangle. I got a 30, 60, 90 triangle. There's the 30. That's got to be 60. That's 90. And this distance is 2. You see why it's 2? Yep. Okay, and I'm trying to solve for the apothem. Well, you can use your 3060 special triangle. In other words, if I know that these two triangles are similar, and I do know that, and there's the dimensions on my unit 3060 triangle, then what's the apothem going to be equal to? In other words, this triangle is similar to this triangle. What's the similarity ratio? Big to little. Big to little is 2 to 1. And I know that some of the geometry teachers will insist on little to big, but trust me, big to little works a lot better. Always compare similar triangles by figuring out that ratio and make sure that ratio is greater than 1. Okay? So this triangle at the bottom is 
the similarity ratio is twice my unit one. So what's the side opposite the 60 degree angle have to be? And that's what my apothem is, is the side opposite the 60 degree angle. Not two. The side opposite the 30 was two. And the side opposite this 30 was two was one. So that gave me a similarity ratio of two to one. So every side in this big triangle has to be twice the side in that little triangle. Well, the side opposite the 60 is root 3. So what's this side opposite the 60 have to be down here? 3 root 6? 2 root 3. It's got to be twice. Hypotenuse would be 4. It's got to be twice. In other words, every side of this bigger triangle is twice the side of this similar triangle. And that allows me to solve for the apothem. So now I have all the numbers I need. The area is one-half the apothem, which is 2 root 3, times the side length, which is 4, times the number of sides, which is 6. So whatever number you get there... And you want to leave it in radical form. In other words, I'm going to cancel that with one of those. So now I have 2 times 2, 4. So that answer is 24 root 3. And that's, that's the answer you want to get, is 24 root 3 and centimeters, square centimeters, centimeters squared. Okay, that's as hard as a polygon's going to get in terms of solving for the area, is where they give you very little information. Uh, they give you only a side length, but the fact that they call it a regular hexagon means that allows you to calculate that central angle. Once you can calculate that central angle, you can solve for the apothem by doing some trig or by comparing similar triangles. In this case, that little triangle ended up being a 30, 60, 90, which we are very familiar with. But it didn't have to be. In other words, if this was a seven-sided figure or something, that angle might be 28 degrees. Okay? Regardless of what it is, we can use trig to solve for the apothem. Based on trig. In other words, even if that's 28 degrees, now I say the tangent of 28 is 2 divided by A. So I would be able to solve for A. So it would not have to be a hexagon to be able to easily solve it. It just has to be any polygon where you can figure out what the central angle is. All right, let's look at this bottom one here, 28. Um, what was the formula for finding a central angle? is 360 divided by the number of sides, right? Exactly. In other words, if that's a seven-sided figure, then it's 360 divided by seven. Eight-sided, 360 divided by eight. So that'll always give you the central angle, and then you're always bisecting that central angle when you drop an apothem down. So half of the central angle is what this angle always is going to be right here. It's going to be half of the central angle. All right. All right. 28. involves this, linear ratio, area ratio, and volume ratio. If my linear ratio is 2 to 1, what's my area ratio? It must be 2 to 1. 4 to 1. It's the square of the linear ratio. And the volume ratio is the cube of the linear ratio. Okay, that's all you have to know, is that the area ratio is the square of the linear ratio, and the volume ratio is the cube of the linear ratio. Here, let me just 
draw a square to prove it to you. I'm going to make that two. Then I'm going to draw a bigger square over here, making each side four. Well, there's my two to one linear ratio, right? Well, what's the area of that? The area of that's four. What's the area of that? Sixteen. Well, notice the area ratios are now four to one. And if I made a volume out of that cube, the volume of the cube is going to be 64. The volume of this cube is going to be 2 times 2 times 2, 8. Notice the volume ratio is 8 to 1. So when you go linear to area to volume, the ratios all get drastically bigger. Okay? So that's all you need to know to answer this problem because they give you the linear ratio. What's the linear ratio? Big to little, five to three. Okay, what's the area ratio? If the linear ratio is five to three, what's the area ratio? It's going to be 25 to nine. Yeah. So that's the area ratio, and they're giving us the area of the bigger one is 225. So x is the area of the little triangle, and that's all we have to solve. Cross multiply, you have 25x equals whatever 9 times 225 is. Let's see, hold on, I can simplify this a little bit. I can divide both sides by 25. So now I have 1 over 9 equals 9 over x. So all I did was divide the left side by 25 and the right side by 25. Now cross multiply, I get x equals 81. Notice how much easier the math got. And so the area of the smaller triangle is 81 square feet or feet squared. Okay. okay. And they could just as easily give you a solid here and one side would be 5 and the other side would be 3 so I would still have a linear ratio of 5 to 3 but now my volume ratio would be 5 thirds cubed. And if they give me the volume of the bigger figure, I could figure out the volume of the smaller figure. So these kind of problems come in multiple flavors, but the most important part you can remember is that the area ratio is the square of the linear ratio, and the volume ratio is the cube of the linear ratio. Uh, we only have about five minutes. Let's talk about the concept of surface area. A number 29. When I'm trying to figure out surface area of a solid like that, well, it's the area of every face that I can count. Well, I've got that face. What's the area of that face right there? Yeah, large face. The one I'm pointed at. The, oh, the back face. Yeah, the back face. Would it be just would it be uh, twelve twelve by six? Correct. Okay, so that's seventy two. Plus the area of each triangle, the front and the back triangle. What's the area of each triangle? And there's two of them, so that's 48. So now the only thing I haven't figured out is the area of this top square and the bottom square. But I have all of the, the only dimension I'm missing is that hypotenuse. If that's 6 and that's 8, what's that hypotenuse? 
always be looking for three, four, five triangles or five, twelve, thirteen triangles because they give them to you so often. Because once when they give it to you and you recognize it, you don't have to do the math. That's got to be ten. In other words, that's a three, four, five triangle. Only it's a six, eight, ten triangle. It's a multiple of three, four, five. Okay, so the we know the area of that triangle, but in order to figure out the area of this face here, we need this hypotenuse, and that's ten. So it's ten times twelve. So plus one hundred and twenty. And then the last face that we haven't talked about is the bottom base. Well, what's the the dimensions of the bottom rectangle? Would it be um, 8 by 12? Yeah, that's 96. So and now you add up each of those surfaces and you get your total surface area. Okay. So for a figure like this, it's pretty straightforward. You just go through every face you can see and try to figure out the dimensions of it and, and do it. Now, when you get to a cone like number 30, there's a special formula for that, and it's the area of the base of the cone, which is pi r squared, plus, and this one is one you just kind of have to remember, pi lambda. Whenever you see that L like that, they're referring to the slant height, and they give that to you. It's 19. So it's just a question of filling in. The radius is 4, so I got 16 pi plus 19 pi. So the surface area of that thing is 35 pi centimeters squared. Areas are always square units. Volumes are always cubic units. And linear measurements are always just Singular, centimeters or inches. Okay. All right, let's see. Is there a 31? Yeah. The height of the pyramid. What does it say next to height of pyramid equals what? 10 centimeters. Okay. So that's the height from the middle of that hexagon straight up to the vertex. And what do they want? They want the surface area of this? Yes. Well, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to do this problem. Uh, to get the surface area, I can figure out the area of the hexagon, but then I got to figure out the area of each of the six triangles, which are all equal areas, but what is that? In other words, this height is not the same as the height of the pyramid. Notice. This is kind of a slant height. So you're going to have to do some geometry and set up another triangle. In other words, if I look at this thing from the side and that's my vertical height, that's 10. Well, the hypotenuse would be that thing, right? In other words, if I take each of the faces of these triangles and draw a vertical down the middle of them, it's actually the hypotenuse of this triangle that I've drawn here. And that triangle I know has a vertical height of 10. This side is the distance of the apothem from there to there. So I would have to go through and figure out that. In other words, I would have to come up with my apothem distance, which is that. So there's a, there's a lot of work to solve this problem here. Um, and you have to have the ability to look at it from multiple angles. In other words, to be able to see that this 
uh, the vertical of each of these triangles is the same as the hypotenuse of that triangle that I've just drawn. Notice this triangle down here is one that you would have to get to the side to see. But the height of that triangle is 10, which is the distance from there up to the top of the vertex. And then looking at the triangle from the side, this distance here would have to be the apothem, right? Right. And what I would calculate, once I know the apothem, that is going to give me the height of that triangle. Well, I know the base of each triangle is 6, so if I know the height, I can figure out the area, and I'm going to be able to figure out the surface area. It's going to be 6 times the area of each triangle plus the area of the hexagon at the base. All right, Patrick. Well, I hope that's been helpful to you, and uh, good luck on your quiz. Your quiz is tomorrow, or your final tomorrow? Yep. Have a good one. Thanks, Thank David. You. Talk to you again until uh, next school semester. I'll talk to you in next fall. All right, David. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Talk to you later. All right.